on today's episode of the Holistic Savage podcast. There's no shortage or deficiency in like quote unquote biohacks you could do in a given day. Like it would keep you so absolutely busy that you would lose your mind. And that's not the point. And this is a responsibility of us as educators and, and podcasters is to really educate on like, how do we get to know our own body and our own needs? So it's very clear that if we are gonna use technology, this is the thing for us. All right, Lauren and Renee, the Biohacker Babes, welcome to the Holistic Savage Podcast. This has been uh, a long time coming, but we're finally here now. We've been friends for a long time, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you both today. We are yeah. so happy to be here, so grateful, and yes. the timing is right. Yeah, cool. thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so to kind of set the stage a little bit, uh, we've been friends, I feel like since 2018, 19, somewhere around there. Um, we run in a lot of the same circles and I just have the utmost respect for the work that you two are doing. Uh, women's biohacking, holistic health, functional medicine, you, you kind of do it all. And, and I feel like you two have done a really good job establishing yourselves within the space and the industry and have, have been, you know, very well respected and, and received by everybody. And I really appreciate the consistency and the integrity of what you two are putting out uh, with your branding, your messaging. And then, of course, we've had the, the privilege of not only getting be friends, but colleagues and doing some collaborative work. Lauren, you've been through my FMHP program and one of the first ever official FMHP practitioners on planet Earth. So a lot of really good things. I think we'll have a really fun conversation today. Wow. Yeah. What, what an intro. Thank you so, I so know. much. Thank it's an honor so to be on your show. We're, we're big fans of everything you're doing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So as we get going, you know, we'll kind of just, I'll, I'll leave it to you two to ping of like who answers first and speaks up. I'm sure you two are, are pros with all the interviewing that you do on, on your podcast and, and others. And, and to the audience listening to this, you know, be sure to check out Biohacker Babes podcast. I've been on there, I think, twice now. Um, but a lot of amazing guests, a lot of amazing content. So we'll include that in the show notes, of course. But I'd love to kind of kickstart the conversation. I never know where the conversation is going to go, but I, I just am so privileged to be connected to a lot of amazing humans and thought leaders and just brilliant minded people. Um, so I'd love to kickstart, you know, your guys' brand is, you know, the biohacker babes. And within our industries, there's kind of all these different spaces, right? There's like functional medicine, like true, pure functional medicine, and then kind of this like more eclectic nebulous sort of holistic health and then there's you know biohacking and there's all these little sub circles in throughout this space like there's some stuff that is like very woo and there's other stuff that's like very hard science something i appreciate about uh you both and, and i try to do it myself is you know certainly kind of being open to intuitive and quantum and a little bit of woo but also trying to stay grounded in like truth, reality, objectivity. And, and I think you two do a really good job of kind of walking that line and breaking really technical things down in a way that's, that's very user friendly. So I'd love to hear you two kind of kick us off by starting with what is your take on like, what is biohacking? What is it not? What should it be? What is it kind of currently becoming? I'd love your perspective on this because I certainly have thoughts and perspectives myself. Oh my gosh, <laughs> such a loaded question. Yeah. And we uh, like yeah. love this question, but it's just changing all the time. Like at this point, Biohacker Babes is just our catchy name that we don't want to change because we think it's pretty cool. But yeah. biohacking can fit into any of those sub circles or categories that you mentioned. It is health optimization, it's longevity, it's functional medicine, it's it's all of those things. It's holistic health. Um and we do kind of see this issue where like all these sub circles that you mentioned are really becoming insular. And I think we need to have more crosstalk because we're all kind of trying to do the same thing. And thank you for saying that. Like, I do believe that we are realists and that I like a little bit of the woo woo, but I want the science. I want the experience. And then at the end of the day, I really just want the individual, the bio individual to have the best experience on this planet. So that looks really different for everyone. And I find in a lot of these categories, it's like, this is the protocol. This is the way. We're not going to entertain any other way. We're not going to talk to other, other people, other perspectives. And in our mind, biohacking is just a way to optimize your own health potential. So 
it's not new. We can we can change the expression of our genes. We can make our time here on Earth better if we choose to do so. We have agency over our health. So I would say just simply biohacking is is taking that agency and also maintaining a curiosity about like how can we do th things differently. My blueprint's not going to be found on Google, as is yours. We're all so so different, and so it does take like a little bit of intelligent experimentation, which I think is a big part of the biohacking. There's a big component of ancestral health. Like, can we just get back to the way our ancestors live? Because a lot of our modern life is truly against us. And and then it's like, what are your goals? I want. I just did a post about longevity and like, I want to live to 100. If <laughs> there's a big if there, like, if I can still be dancing and skiing and laughing with my loved ones, like that's my goal. That might not be everyone else's goal. Um, so biohacking is really just getting clear on what your goals and intentions are and optimizing that to whatever potential you want it to go to. How about that? Renee? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, ditto to all that. I love that, Lauren. Yeah, I would say biohacking to me is just anything that is tweaking your internal or external environment to optimize your health. And yeah, it can be all of the things that you just said, Lauren, functional medicine, holistic health, all of that. And I think humans are innately biohackers. We've been grounding and using sunshine for circadian rhythm and eating local seasonal food like forever. I think that is biohacking, right? Because it's all things that are optimizing our health. And I think something important to point out, I don't think biohacking is putting magnets in our body and injecting chips into our brain and gene editing. And I think some people actually sometimes I'll go online and just search biohacking and see what comes up. And it's like these crazy articles like biohacker implants 36 magnets inside her body. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's that that is definitely not biohacking to me. Um, like I'm I just think, trying to get more sunshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I think it's really important as biohackers to find a way to track what you're doing, right? We always say you can't hack what you don't track. And whether that is functional lab testing, a wearable like an aura ring or a sleep tracker of some sort, something to keep you... I think one accountable, but really to see if what you're doing is making a difference. And subjective data is wonderful as well. However, you want to do that questionnaires, journaling, things like that. But I think getting the quantitative data can really kind of propel us even faster down this health optimization journey. Okay. Yeah. I, I just like, wanted to add yeah, one more yeah, thing please about do, like please do. what it's not. I think what it's not, and we see this in all areas, not just biohacking, but it is not jumping to the magic pill solution. Like it mm -hmm. is still really hard work and we don't really know what that path from A to B is going to be, but we could very easily just say like, screw it. I'm not going to go outside. I'm not going to ground. I'm going to buy a PEMF mat and I'm going <laughs> to mm -hmm. like do ozone. I'm going to buy all these gadgets to optimize my internal environment which is an option but i think we always have to prioritize like can you do the ancestral way first if not then we have these like lateral moves we can choose if and when that's appropriate this episode is brought to you by microbiome labs i've been a raving fan of microbiome labs for many years now because of their cutting edge research novel microbiome solutions and heartfelt culture Many supplement companies exaggerate their product claims and have no research to back up what they say. Microbiome Labs, on the other hand, has up-leveled the entire functional medicine industry by modeling a research-first approach. Microbiome Labs has advanced the research of the human microbiome and offers many innovative tools to improve whole body health through the garden of life that is the microbiome, including the BiomeFX stool test, and the Total Gut Restoration System. While I have used virtually all of their products successfully with my private clients, some of my favorite products include the Megaspore Biotic, their flagship product that is a multiple strain endospore probiotic that promotes microbial diversity, mucosal barrier and intestinal lining integrity, short chain fatty acid production, and whole body health. I also love the Mega IgG 2000, which is pure serum bovine immunoglobulins that act as a defensive shield in the gut to bind and neutralize many pathogens and toxins, such as lipopolysaccharide, gluten proteins, mold toxins, exotoxins, microbial components, and so much more. I also love to use their Myomax, which is a specialized form of vitamin K2 that promotes mitochondrial function and energy production. 
It's actually clinically researched and shown to increase volume of oxygen or VO2, which is a very powerful indicator of cardiovascular fitness. Be sure to visit the Microbiome Labs link in my show notes to learn more and get your microbiome support today. Hey, I'm Renee from the Biohacker Babes, along with my sister, Lauren. What's up, everybody? We're the Biohacker Babes, and I am a FMHP graduate, uh, a student of Brendan's, and he is doing incredible research to further the mental health epidemic. There is so much need in this space and people that need our support through functional medicine. So he's created an amazing project, which is going to educate and empower people all over the world. And he has these amazing t-shirts. You got to get one. Renee is wearing one. Model, Vanna White. Yes. Thank you to Brennan. Just like you said, amazing work. People are looking for answers today to feel better overall and their mental well-being. So we're big supporters and uh, thanks for all that you're doing. I really appreciate uh, this answer because candidly, uh, like I, I'm, I admit my ignorance of like, I've never really dabbled that much in kind of the biohacking space and world. Like I just went to my first biohacker conference, you know, a few weeks ago in, in Florida and it was like a new one. It was the first time. And honestly, it probably wasn't the best one to like start with. Cause it, it didn't give me like the best impression of what, you know, biohacking is. And you know, there's, there's some scrupulous characters, uh, look, there's scrupulous characters everywhere. Welcome to planet Earth, right? You know, um, it's not unique to biohacking. There's a lot of scrupulous characters in functional medicine, holistic health, biohacking. But, you know, admittedly, like if it wasn't for you two and in, in, in the friendship and, and uh, you know, professional relationship I have with you both, I probably would have like a kind of salty, sour attitude towards biohacking as sort of an industry in space. Um, but even in just that synopsis and description of from your perspective as leaders in the women's biohacking space and the biohacking space at large, that's kind of what I believe biohacking should be and what it should stand for. I really like how you kind of weave together, okay, first off the ancestral and, and the primal, right? And then weaving that into objectivity. I'm, I'm, you know, you both know this, I'm huge on objectivity. Um, and I like how you phrase that of, you know, we are all biohackers and optimizing our health, altering our epigenetics. It's kind of like the, you know, the concept of self-healing, which, you know, my friend Nicole LaPera really was the one to kind of breathe life into that sort of like hashtag and, and concept. But it's not like that's a new concept. Like we as, as biological sentient organisms, we have always been self-healing organisms, but what's interesting about modern times and, and consumerism and the age of information and AI and just the world we live in today, it's interesting to see people sort of divide into different factions of what they really identify with. And it's, it's an identity thing. It's, you could even argue sometimes it's an identity crisis that drives people into certain, you know, markets and spaces. And well, I identify as, you know, whatever, whether it's like, I'm a, I'm a polyvagal person, or I'm a somatic breath work person, or I'm a biohacker, or I'm a holistic health, whatever. And so I definitely, what I like about what you both just said is it's in perfect alignment with what functional medicine should be and should be about. And there's a lot of issues with functional medicine. It's what health and fitness, you know, good old classic personal training, nutrition coaching, what that should all be about. And so to me, something I am trying to bring to at least my audience or whoever the hell tunes into whatever I'm talking about is what are we all saying in common? You know, what are the thematic elements of what really builds deep health, true health? Because I do, especially with biohacking, I worry about kind of the confused consumerism, right? Like maybe I sort of bypass the foundational lifestyle components that actually really build health, but then I'll buy like a $10,000 thing that uses technology. I don't even understand to do something that I can't really comprehend or, or quantify. Right. I'm curious your, your perspectives on that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we do hear a lot of people, clients or audience and just people in the general space at, and at biohacking conferences, like people that are a little newer to this idea 
that are just insanely overwhelmed because yeah. it is crowded, not just with like thoughts and perspectives, but with technology devices, there is no shortage or deficiency in like quote unquote biohacks you could do in a given day. Like it would keep you so absolutely busy that you would lose your mind. And that's not the point. Yeah. So I think a lot of us, we lack, and this is a responsibility of us as educators and, and podcasters is to really educate on like, how do we get to know our own body and our own needs? So it's very clear that if we are going to use technology, this is the thing for us. We don't need all 100 pieces of tech at all times. I'm trying to live a very minimal life. I love biohacking tech because I've had great experiences and there's some things I can quantify and some things it's like, maybe it's a little more woo woo where I'm going off of a feeling, mm -hmm. but that's ultimately for me to decide. Um, but my end goal is to not need any of this stuff. Really? I would, I would love that. And I travel a lot. So I'm always like, how can I not worry about packing my supplements, my devices, like all the, can I just take me? I would love that. That's not always the case because sometimes, you know, travel is stressful. Mm -hmm. Travel is a great time to bring these things. But yeah, I think I'm not even really remembering what your original question is, but I think it's really just about the bio individual, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what do we need? There's, there's never an, um, a shortage of things to, to be done in a day. That's overwhelming people. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I think part of our job as the biohacker babes is to test out as many things as we can and give honest opinions. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we are very fortunate that we get a lot of these things for free to test out because I don't expect most people are going to go out and buy all these things because you could easily spend like a hundred grand on all the biohacks. So I will happily test it out and give my honest opinion. And just because it doesn't work for me, it doesn't mean it's not going to work for the next person, but I'm still going to speak my honest truth about what I think about the product mm -hmm. just to kind of like narrow down. And I'm like, Lauren, when I travel, I try to not pack my biohacks. Like I was just in Hawaii and like, man, what a beautiful place being in nature where you shouldn't need to really biohack, right? I mean, I had my feet on the earth. I was in the sunshine, all the things I kind of mentioned before that are ancestral hacking, but it's like, how can we get back to that? I'm curious with the, I'm assuming it was the biohacker expo that you went to. What was like the big thing? Was it very like tech and gadget heavy or product heavy? Um, yeah. So it, it, uh, you know, obviously I always strive to be, you know, respectful. Uh, it was the biohacker expo. I don't remember the name of the woman that like orchestrated it and put it on. It, it felt pretty random to be honest, as far as like the, uh, event hall, uh, the expo center that they held it in. And, you know, they had like William Shatner was kind of like one of the big names that they were sort of banking on, which felt really random. I'm like, is he a biohacker? I see. I have no idea. <laughs> like, yeah. I saw you know, it all over Instagram. What? Yeah. It was, it was a little random. Um, but you know they had some they had some good people there like dr chris palmer was there and so i got to meet him chat with him a little bit you know my uh, mutual friend ben azadi was there so i caught up with him a little bit and then i met uh tim gray who i i wasn't familiar with him previously but he's like a big biohacker over in the uk so i'm going to his event in june in in london um the health optimization we thought about going oh, i want to oh, go oh. Well, you should go. You should go. I'm <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Yeah. I'll be hopping across the pond, go check that. And I've heard great things about it. And to give him some credit, I, you know, I, I met him briefly uh, and he gave a talk. I felt bad for him because they, the, the, the mic, the slides, they were having a lot of technical issues. So he's the poor guy's like standing up. Anyways, don't need to get into it. But um, but I met him briefly and I appreciated that his talk that he gave was really like all about, you know, the free biohacks, the lifestyle bio biohacks, which I thought was a really important message to be communicating, you know, because then obviously there's a lot of very expensive kind of high end, you know, gadgets and gizmos and stuff. And look, you know, not, not like I'm trying to roast biohacking, but rather having this sort of exploratory conversation conceptually. Uh, because too, you know, I could, I also, you know, criticize functional medicine of like, it's too heavy on lab testing and, and supplements. It's, it's an out of pocket allopathic model using a lot of kind of experimental functional labs that 
mostly don't have established clinical significance. And then, you know, nutraceuticals that get really expensive really quick and a lot of throw the pills at the lab and then it's all, all out of pocket. And it's like, how is that functional, right? The even yeah. bigger problem is I, I have a lot of clients that come to me from, I hate to say it, but it's like a lot of naturopaths. Um, mm -hmm. They don't they don't distinguish between naturopath and naturopath because I don't know that the client even knows the difference. But yep. whatever they are, they are coming with this long list of supplements. Maybe the supplements aren't bad per se, but they have no idea why they're taking them. And I think that's maybe like the number one issue because mm -hmm. we're not empowering and educating the client to even understand what they're trying to affect in their body. So one, how do we create compliance? Two, like that is just a crime to not educate truly. Mm -hmm. If they don't have like a holistic understanding of what their body's needs are and how we can support it with the behaviors, because I don't believe you can just take supplements. I love supplements, but it's not that one thing that's going to move the needle that far. We have to do all of the lifestyle and behaviors, behavioral stuff that you preach so often. So again, I think it comes back to education. Like, do we mm -hmm. even know why we're doing it? And I, I will say, I came across this term recently. This is popping in my head. Bio slacker. And if you've heard this bio slacker, uh, so it's like a lazy biohacker. Mm. And so I think we have to be really careful of that too. Yeah. Just like you said, not just adding a supplement or adding another device because we don't want to go work out, go out in the sunshine, you know, ground our feet on the earth, things like that. Um, so not being a lazy biohacker. So you two, like, again, you, you two do a great job because I, I see you testing out new products, you know, all the time and, and giving your honest reports and everything. And, and of course, we will get into like, what are some of your, you know, favorite biohacks and stuff. But you two still work with clients privately, don't you? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, uh, highly curious. I, I love talking to other practitioners and, and coaches of kind of what the pain points are, the struggles are with, you know, what do you two find to be some of the pain points and challenges with, with helping your private clients really improve their health? Because certainly, you know, something that we're all agreeing on is the amount of just overwhelm and sort of confusion and the conflicting information. And they're like, well, who do I listen to and all that? So I'm, I'm curious what you guys see in, in, in your practice and, and how, how do you help them navigate that with, you know, okay, you integrate, you know, the supplements and the biohacks, but all the while trying to keep them focused on, you know, their why and, and foundational concepts. I will say par part of the problem with not having a really good niche is I see a really wide range of clients. Um, I have the biohackers on one end. I've worked for ben, ben Greenfield for about five years. And what I see in the biohacking community is they, they always want more, more lab tests, more devices, more supplements, more, more, more. Mm -hmm. And so for that crowd, it's like, how can we take a step back and just like slow down be more present. Again, going back to like your why, why are we biohacking? Is it just we want to feel better and better and better? Or do we want to live longer for a certain reason? Like always circling back to the why. But for those people, it's really slowing down, which is hard. And I'm guilty of that. And for me, actually, something that helped me really slow down was plant medicine. And maybe we'll get into that today. But really realizing I wasn't being present all the time. And when I incorporated plant medicine, which forces you to be present, I was like, oh, this feels icky. Ugh, I don't like this feeling. But that taught me to slow down and be more present. So for biohackers, I find that that can be really important. On the other total end of the spectrum, I have seen people that are just coming to me for weight loss. They're still eating the standard American diet. They're not going to the gym at all. And again, for them, it's finding their why. Why do they want to change these things? And for those people, it's making really small tweaks. I mean, it's like, drinking more water, not eating for 12 hours overnight, getting eight hours of sleep. Like it's so, so basic, but so many of these people aren't doing that. And then they're also on a long list of medications and they don't know why they're on them. So kind of a long answer to say, like I've seen such a wide spectrum and mm -hmm. it's it's such a personal journey. And so I love spending like 90 minutes with that person for the first call and just really getting to know them and seeing what do they need? Where are they starting? What direction do we want to go with this? Yeah, I think letting yeah. the client direct the show a little bit. We're, mm. Like we're there to facilitate yeah. and to educate, but like it's their health. Mm -hmm. They get to run the show and, and create the trajectory. 
there were so many things that were coming up for me when you asked that question. So I'm just going to go with like a theme that has been of late, like people mm -hmm. coming to me, clients for all different sort of goals and intentions, but across the board, they've tried everything mm -hmm. and nothing's happening. They're stuck. You could just say across the board, they're all stuck. And there's been like this really thematic narrative that keeps coming up. I've, I've, I must have heard it from seven different people last week alone. I'm a mess. I'm so sorry. Like, I'm, I, I guess I must just be this way. This is just going to be my life. That narrative mindset just one, like crushes me. Like it hurts my heart so deeply when someone has tried so many things, but you see this mental, emotional mindset that's really holding them back. And so I think as a practitioner, I mean, we have all these different tools and you have to know when to pull out which tools for which client. As Renee said, like the biohackers are gonna need something totally different than the people that are still like, still don't understand the concept of eating real food. Like that is still really foreign to some people. What seems like universally foreign to a lot of people, I think is like how much your brain and your mindset really control your physiology, mm -hmm. truly. And if you have this, story playing over and over in the back of your mind like i will never get better like i'm not deserving of getting better this mm -hmm. is how i'm supposed to be like i guess this is just my luck we gotta start there that yeah. is like number one can we just start with the mindset and i think as, as a practitioner some of that is just sitting with them giving them time to listen and time for them to be heard and that's something that is reflected back on me so many times my clients go, Oh my God, like, thank you. Thank you just for being here with me and listening. Yeah. That alone was worth the price of admission. Right. And it's like, we can do a lot of other things, but like that really gets the, get things going. We get momentum in, in that space. So gosh, just like one, one answer to your question, but. This episode is brought to you by DHA laboratory. Whether you are a self healer trying to get to the root of your chronic health complaints, or a functional practitioner looking to provide your clients or patients with the best lab testing available, DHA is your one-stop shop for all your lab testing needs. DHA offers self-healers the ability to order a wide range of lab testing to empower their self-healing journey with actionable data, while providing practitioners a consolidated lab test ordering experience to cut down on the hassle of ordering many tests from many separate labs. DHA Laboratory is also a pioneer in advancing the research of cryptopyral disorder, a commonly overlooked root cause factor in a myriad of mental health disorders. DHA is also the exclusive provider of the Mental Map, which is a cutting edge lab panel that I personally designed to help self healers and practitioners get to the root causes of their mental health struggles using the most clinically significant and relevant biomarkers available. Be sure to use the link in my show notes to learn more about DHA Laboratory to up-level your self-healing journey or functional practice today. I, I love it. I feel like we're we're at a good point now. We can just like dive into the rabbit hole a little bit. Um, I always like to kind of go down these sort of trippy, um, profound things because I'm I'm listening to both of you and and you know certainly I. I try to communicate in a way that the audience will be able to resonate and, and receive and, and digest because practitioners like us, we don't even have to say it. You know, I know we're aligned and, and, you know, kind of philosophically and everything because I'm thinking about how with, you know, whether, whether the vehicle to eudaimonic self-actualization and, and health optimization, longevity, whatever, whatever it is, whatever the end goal is, there's a lot of vehicles and tools that we can use to get there, right? You know, it could be in the form of biohacking. It could be in the form of functional medicine. It could be in the form of, of CrossFit and personal training or carnivore or, you know, what, whatever sort of sub-faction, you know, community, culture, um, you know, I think of how even with my own eclectic journey of starting with fitness nutrition, and then it's like, but I also do a ton of yoga and I'm also really into psychedelics and da, 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 da. And having done all of these different modalities and methodologies, 
there's actually more similar across the board than anything else of, of what you're saying. At the end of the day, whether it's you're doing somatic breath work or neurolimbic retraining or tickling your polyvagal nerve or whatever, um, it just kind of comes down to, I, I think with, you know, clients, self healers, humans, souls, uh, it really comes down to like, how do you bring them back to themselves? Right. That's kind of what, what I heard when I'm listening to you both talk is sure. Maybe. Um, and I, I see this all the time through, through my business model and practice where the majority of inquiries I get, you know, are people that like want to do the mental map, right? Because they see me talking about this mental map thing and it sounds so cool and it looks so cool. And it's, it's almost, uh, and I'm very transparent about it. it. It's almost like an intentional sort of bait and switch where it's like, that might be the hook that gets you to, you know, give me your attention span and allow me the opportunity to hold space for you. But all the while, I'm really just trying to guide you back to yourself, guide you back to, you know, your why and reflecting, you know, those self deprivational self limiting narratives, right. And so it's kind of like, how do we construct that space? How do we um, invite them into that space? So we can hold that safe space where it's not to your point, we're not being dictator practitioners of you do this and, you know, kind of prescribing this regimen upon you and, and, you know, whip you to do it. Um, but trying to get them back to understanding what their truth really is. Right. Yeah. And yeah. interesting. I agree with that. Like we can't be dictators. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's just a trait of being like a good human. This is not a health coaching thing. It's like, can we practice active listening mm -hmm. and mirroring and some motivational interviewing that gets them to speak their truth. Like sometimes just holding that mirror for them and like stating back what we hear that that's like, yeah, that is worth more than lab tests sometimes, right. For them to be like, Oh my, Oh my gosh, do I, am I really saying that? Mm -hmm. Do I really believe that? And then that's their work. Like you can't unhear these things. And they get to take that with them where it's like a list of supplements is like, oh man, what did I do with that list? Forgot yeah. it. Can't find my supplements, but you have someone mirror back your self-talk that's going to stay with you. And that's beautiful. Like you get to sit with that and work on it at your own leisure. And like, we can't push people to do that work, of course, but um, just like opening up the opportunity for that conversation, I think is just so needed. R Renee, I'm really curious to hear about your psychedelic stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, if you want to share a little bit. Sure. I mean, it's just been kind of like the undertone across all my journeys is not being present, like I said. And it started, uh, I, can I speak totally openly about this on? Yeah, please. Like, this, this, this is a very safe, open, anything goes space. Okay, okay. So I I did my I had my second mushroom journey. I was with Lauren and my husband, her husband, and some other friends. And I was treating it as just like a fun social thing. Because mm. I will say the first time I did it, I, you know, sat in setting, I wrote my intentions, and then we just like giggled for three hours. I was like, well, that was fun. So the second time I said, I don't need to set intentions. This is gonna be a light, fun activity. And it was very hard for four hours. I struggled the whole time. Uh, felt very sad. Felt like there, I was never going to experience happiness again. Mm. I couldn't understand why everyone around me was having, quote unquote, fun. And oof, it, it, was, it was very eye-opening. I came out of that said, I'm never doing any of that. I'm never touching any of that ever again. Psychedelics mm. are not for me. Now I've done it several times since then. And I have been brought the same lesson every time. And especially when I was in Costa Rica, I actually did Wachuma, which is a little bit different. It's a little bit more of a heart opener than mushrooms. And it's a long journey. It's 16 hours. Ooh. And I get about eight hours in and I start experiencing that same feeling that I was feeling on that mushroom journey. And I said to my guide, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to get off the ride. He goes, you better strap in because you got another, you know, potentially eight hours to go. Mm -hmm. And he was like, 
he was really so helpful. And he was like, what, what, why don't you want to just be in this moment? And it really came to me that I, I've been such a planner. I'm always looking in the future. What's next? What else can I be doing? How can I plan, plan, plan? That I wasn't just sitting in the moment. Mm. And oh man, it felt so icky. But coming out of that, I've been trying to, you know, do more microdosing, which is a little bit more of a gentle reminder yeah. of being in the moment, not multitasking. And it, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. But I think it also is really a good some good insight as to maybe why I crashed and burned so bad back in 2007, 2008, when all of my health problems started. I had mercury toxicity. I got mono. I was sleeping four hours a night, but it was very much that go, go, go mentality that it, it, it just led to the total, total crashing after I graduated college. And anyways, this is becoming a really long ramble as to say, I wasn't living in the moment. I wasn't being totally present with people. And it feels mm -hmm. so different when you have a conversation with someone and there's no electronics around and you're just looking at that person eye to eye and having a real conversation. That feels so different than when you have your phone next to you. Oh, hold on. Let me just check. Oh, someone just texted me. Oh, hold on. But, but you don't remember anything that person said to you. I can mm -hmm. tell you that. Um, yeah. So just being more present. That's my, mm -hmm. that's the journey I've been on. So thank you to the plants for bringing mm -hmm. me here. It wasn't always the most fun ride, but. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. And, and, you know, certainly, um, I can't help myself. Like psychedelics are one of my absolute favorite subjects to talk about, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, it might start, we're talking like, you know, some functional medicine subject or some biohack or whatever, but, but ultimately I think spiritual health, eudaimonic health in, in general. And, you know, with this sort of psychedelic wave and, and obviously Lauren, you know, you, you have psychedelic training, you're an integration coach, and, and I know you have your own experience and we can kind of expand this a little bit. Um, you know, certainly I always, I, I try to be polite to the audience of giving fair disclaimers. I recognize psychedelics won't resonate with everybody. I, I, um, and that's okay. Uh, I don't think psych psychedelics are at all necessary. They're not required. Your, your, your physiology is not deficient in LSD or psilocybin, right? Uh, however, you know, I've, I've experienced a decent amount of things in my life and I really can't think of anything more powerful, you know, as far as a connecting your connecting to yourself. Right. And I remember there was this one time, um, I would say LSD is my favorite out of the ones I've tried so far. Um, you know, I think microdosing with mushrooms is kind of the easiest way to get started. Uh, you know, I think MDMA is out of this world for certain types of, of goals and intentions. Um, but LSD is something that for me has been, it's just like this divine clarity that I get every time. And I always like to say, and I'm, I'm curious how it resonates with you too, you know, with any psychedelic, like it's not putting anything in your psyche that wasn't there. Like it's enhancing what is already in quite literally your neural networks. It's just enhancing what is in your soul, what is written across your genetic code, what is planted in your neural networks. And it's blowing it up with this kind of euphoric vibrancy. That's not always pleasant. And I'll kind of level with you a little bit, Renee, uh, in that, whereas when I first started psychedelics back in, I don't know, 2018, 19, somewhere around there, my initial experiences were all beautiful, beautiful, profound, like confirming what I've always intuitively hoped is truth about the human experience. Like I always felt like there was more to this human condition than just nine to five, jump through the hoops of society and, you know, whatever. I'm like, I think there's more. I feel deep in my soul stuff like there's more. And then, you know, with the substance, I'm like, oh my God, there is more. Everything's energy, blah, blah, blah. But I'll admit in, you know, the past two years of my life have not been 
uh, the easiest. You know, it's challenged me on on some deep levels, and so I've actually found. Uh, I don't use psychedelics quite as often as I used to, but the experiences I have had, okay, what it was bringing up was not nearly as, you know, pleasant, like a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, kind of a lot of yuck. And it's like, ooh, you know, um, that doesn't feel great. And and Lauren, I'll, I'll be curious your perspective on this, because I say this all the time of like, I think with psychedelics, I, I think most people, most not all. Um, I think there's people that have done a lot of inner work, self-healing, spiritual practice, introspection, therapy, whatever it is that has brought them more into alignment with their own soul. But I think a lot of people, arguably the majority of, of the population, at least in America, is living this very hedonic, run from pain, run towards pleasure on that hamster wheel, get that next hit, get that next high, instant gratification, and not really fully conscious of why they even do what they do, right? And so that's kind of one plane of reality. And that's where we see a lot of addiction, a lot of mental illness, a lot of, you know, struggle. And then there's sort of truth. And then there's the subjective perception of truth. But I think as you do spiritual practice or psychotherapy, introspective work or psychedelics and integration, doesn't really matter the vehicle, but you try to overlap those planes of reality. And at least for myself, what I've found, um, and you know, I'll give myself a little credit. I think I've done a lot of good work. And so what I, what I found is like, you know, you're sober, you take the drug and then all of a sudden it transplants you into the truth of reality. And it's like, oh my God, every, everything I've b believed is a lie. Like life is a lie. Everybody, you know, like this is truth. This is reality. And so then you're over here in this field and through the integration work, you try to overlap. And to your point, Renee, it's like, you know, the microdose is kind of that reminder, you know, you come out of a trip and you're, you're aligned, aligned AF, but then you get, you know, guess what? When, when the high wears off, when the drugs wear off, guess what? You still have to go to work. You still have to pay your taxes. You still have to deal with the conflict that you're trying to avoid. Right. But you can get that reminder when you're feeling a little out of, out of alignment and something I've experienced is I like to think it means I'm living more aligned all the time because like when I get high on the substance while sure I'm high and I'm euphoric and whatever, but my line of thinking and my psychology doesn't change anymore. There's no shift in how I look at things or how I logically unpack things. It's the same. It's just enhanced. Right. But I'm curious, Renee and Lauren, your perspective on, because you could look at psychedelics as like a biohack or, or whatever it is, but you know, how do you see this from a kind of unpacking your own self-limiting beliefs like we're talking about and bringing people back to themselves? I'm curious how you see this being incorporated and, and how even, well, let me stop there because then I have a part two question. <laughs> Ooh, um. mm. <laughs> I know that was a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Say, say the question one more time. I want to be super clear so I can, because my there's so much to say about. Psychedelics. Yeah. Well, since you both have experienced psychedelics, and and it, it's not necessarily that I'm trying to drill either of you on using psychedelics specifically or whether you think they should be used or not, but rather, I think the concept of helping people uncover their truth and identify, you know, their self-limiting beliefs. And, you know, how do we go about fixing it? Because I love Renee with your humility of like, you're a professional, you're a badass. And yet you also have your own sort of cellular, you know, struggles of, of presence, for example, and kind of what, what lessons that brings for you and then the ongoing journey, right? Yeah, I think a lot of these narratives, and if we are going to go more towards like the negative self-talk or limiting beliefs have been put on us by like structures and systems in society. We're taught as young children that the world is really binary and there's right and wrong. And a lot of us lose like creative orientation and we really can lose ourselves at such a young age that we don't even really know the difference. So we subconsciously are conditioned to start looking for answers outside of ourselves mm -hmm. so early on. And what I love about psychedelics, you said truth. Um, what comes up for me is more just like 
this amplification and, and understanding of our struggles and curiosities. What I hear the most from clients, and I primarily work with microdosing, is, oh no, I feel so tired all, all of a sudden. Is that normal? Or I feel really hungry. Is that normal? Or I feel really angry all of a sudden. And I'm not wanting to be friends with my friends. That's truth, right? Mm. Like we start living within these structures and systems that have been put upon us that really are not aligned with our own truth. Mm. And so we get ourselves into these situations to meet expectations, to meet external expectations, not our own expectations. And so that can start to feel like it happens so subtly that we don't even realize that it's happening when we fall into social circles or fall into a career path. Um, fall into this negative mindset. We don't realize it's happening because we're just adapting to our environment, which is great, but we can get further and further away from ourselves. And so the mushrooms just like, just bring you back to your center, your truth self, where like you can't experience these lies anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that could be, oh, I don't want to be friends with those people. Like it doesn't feel good to me anymore. Suddenly, or I could hang out with them before. And now I'm like, it just feels icky. Like that's really essential information or it could just be oh i'm so tired because you haven't been sleeping because you're a go 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 person you're sleep deprived you believe that more is better that productivity makes you a good person and so you are your body's tired and the mushrooms are going to tell you that mm -hmm. and that's the hard truth about it is that it's hard work mm -hmm. so you, you do have to be ready for it and that's why i think it's not for everyone that's really what it's about some people are not ready for that work. And even still, you know, there's other intricacies of the different substances and how they interact with our unique physiology, but you really have to be ready to take a hard look at what those, what that internal monologue is. Um, and I use something called internal family systems, which is commonly used in psychotherapy models, but can you look in the mirror and go, oh, that's my firefighter protecting me. This is my manager protecting me. We have all of these protective mechanisms and kind of different voices and, and selves within our one self. And if we can just get curious about what they are, why they're here, what they're trying to say, we can we can listen and not attach ourselves to those voices and, and thoughts. And then it just becomes easier to come back to what you mentioned is truth or true self. So it gets easier, like life, we create more ease and more joy because suddenly we're not following everyone else's rules, which I think is really powerful. Like I'm a rule follower, but yeah. am I living in alignment with someone else's expectations or mm -hmm. can I align myself with how, like, how can I show up best in this world? And that's what I think is the most amazing thing about psychedelics is that I get to be true self and show up in this world the way that I know and and should be, right? If we were all the same, how boring. We wouldn't get things done. I don't know what the world would look like if we all just became the same person. Um, and so it becomes a more colorful, diverse, and I think powerful world if we can come back home. Mm. I love that. Just to share something else that I have personally learned, like Lauren was saying, you know, if you are tired or you are angry, it will show you that. And, you know, for me, it was it was showing a lot of sadness, even just like microdosing and smaller journeys, sadness. I'm like, what is this? I'm like the happiest person in the world. What is this sadness stuff? It feels terrible. And it kept coming up, kept coming up. And I finally I did a session with someone, no psychedelics involved. Mm -hmm. And we were just mapping emotions back to childhood. And guess what was coming up? Sadness. And again, I'm like, what is this? By the end of the session, I'm just like bawling my eyes out for 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, wow. I feel like I just like lost 10 pounds. And I even told her, I said, you know what? I haven't cried in over a year. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah. And it feels so good to cry. And for me, again, this lesson is like, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to experience all of the emotions of the human experience. Yeah. But I had this like thing ingrained in my brain that like, no, we should always be happy, joyful, grateful, all the positive, blah, blah, blah. We don't want to experience all the bad emotions. So, so reframing that 
there's no such thing as a bad emotion and it's okay to experience all those. I'm like, man, how many years of sadness did I just like repress? Because I didn't want to be that person. Mm. I didn't want to feel that emotion. So trying to let that out and like, man, since I cried like four weeks ago, God, it felt so good. Yeah. It felt so good. And you know what? In Costa Rica, over a year ago, that was the last time I had cried before then, same experience. Just like extreme, this extreme release of emotion. And especially with Chuma, so with Chuma will really go after what emotion is in your heart. And if there is any grief or sadness, it will come out. I didn't know that going into Wachuma. Found that out after. Yeah. Um, but it just it's amazing what it can show you. And I love that permission to feel. I, I have such a peeve, yeah. uh, pet peeve when people apologize for crying. Like when people laugh, no one's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm laughing. But when people cry, they're like, I'm, so, I'm sorry that I'm sad. It's like, why are we apologizing? Mm -hmm. Or the other side where yeah. people say, stop crying, or why are you crying? No one questions when you are laughing and experiencing joy, but it's all just a release of emotion. Like, what's the what's the difference? The difference is that it makes somebody else uncomfortable. Like, they're yeah. making it about themselves. We should have the permission to be aligned and in our true self and express however we need to express. There is no bad. There's no good. It's all just emotion that generally needs to come out because yeah. if you're repressing it, is that, are you taking it through your entire life? Is it manifesting as autoimmunity or chronic fatigue or weight loss resistance or depression? Like who knows what that's, how that's manifesting in your physical body over time. Mm -hmm. the emotions are so powerful. I, I love the way that this conversation is kind of unfolding and, and I, you know, I can't help myself because what we're talking about, I, I think is extremely powerful. There's a lot of acceptance. There's a lot of surrender. Um, and something, you know, I've noticed just, just in the past few years with, you know, this, this psychedelic wave and, you know, there's so much with all of that. Right. And, and of course we're already seeing, pharma trying to kind of gobble it up to monetize it. And we don't necessarily need to get into all of that. Um, cause that's more like the business model, the legality side of it. Uh, but something that, that kind of irks me a little bit, this culture and, you know, there's some, I'm sure you two have seen her, whatever her name is. There's a few of them, but there's this one girl, blonde lady, and she'll wear like this obnoxiously large crystal like on her forehead. And she's really just making fun of, you know, all of these like spiritual because we are seeing what I think is a bastardization of the psychedelic culture and movement where now it's like you. OK, let me let me back up a little bit. You know, psychedelics are they're ancient. You know they're 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 primordial especially mushrooms you know synthetics that's that's different they were synthesized by you know somebody like um what's his name abraham hoffer abram or whatever the guy that did uh made lsd synthesized it you know whereas like um you know psilocybin or uh you know mescaline and, and san pedro and stuff uh all these like ancient shamans and we definitely are seeing this cultural phenomena in america of you know, if we're just kind of calling it candidly of like privileged white people that then bop down to Costa Rica to do their bougie psychedelic retreats. And now they, th there's this hilarious meme that I saw circulating recently. And it said like, um, you know, I finally killed my ego and now I'm better than everybody else. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. You know, it, and I will admit, like, I will admit, you know, when, when I first was dabbling with psychedelics, um, not, I don't think I ever got carried away, but there definitely was that sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, you can't unsee it. And, you know, there is something to be said about, especially in today's world and the polarization and the politics and, and, you know, kind of factionism, if you will, um, what I don't like is seeing this sort of psychedelic culture that's all these people that sort of project their egos of like, look how spiritual I am. And they dress up to play the part, right? You know, they they wear the most ridiculous like outfits of like, that's how, in the dreadlocks and the beads and the things. 
And I feel like that kind of bastardizes what psychedelics are supposed to be all about, because it's just like, this is all just a bunch of ego projection, which is completely antithetical to what psychedelics are supposed to be. Yeah, I want to see a yeah. businesswoman walking down the street in her business attire, like smile on her face, just like in reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people can and express however they want, but you're, sure. you're right, there is. Have fun. Yeah, it's a bastardization for sure. I have to point out Brent Pella. I am yeah. obsessed with him. Do you follow uh, him? I, I the comedian guy with the, the comedian. Hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so he uh, he did this uh, Instagram reel or skit. How how to let people know you're spiritual? Yeah. And one was to wear beaded bracelets. Yeah. Yep. Two was to wear like a wide brim hat. Yeah. And then it was like three. If people still don't know if you're spiritual, post an Alan Watts quote on your Instagram page. Yeah. <laughs> So oh, everything no. you were saying just reminds there. me like <laughs> Well, and look, look, I like I I I you know, hypocrisy is something I can't stand and I'll admit I'm wearing beads right now. I I post Alan Watts, you know, on occasion, right? You know, um so I I certainly don't want to be a hypocrite cuz but but that's what when I see it being obnoxious, I'm like, well, you're kind of ruining it for the rest of us like it doesn't you know, and then there's kind of, there's an argument of like, okay, maybe I'm just one of those people that has to be like anti-culture of like, you know, whatever the mainstream is doing. I don't want to be doing that because, you know, um, but this isn't new either because, you know, like the, that Netflix series, how to change your mind, which I thought was really well done. Like, I thought that was a really well done, you know, docu-series to kind of bring some psychedelic information to, uh you know, to the mainstream. And even in, in the psilocybin episode, you know, the like old Mexican lady or Hispanic lady, that's like the, you know, mother of psilocybin or whatever, you know, her deal was. And, and they went into that history of like, I think it was even in, in the sixties where, you know, a bunch of white American kids like going to that town. And they were talking about how like this woman who was like the, the wise one and, yeah. And then like, last year. yeah. And then she was like exiled and, and harassed and everything because they kind of blamed her for then, you know, attracting all of these, you know, unruly white Americans that were coming down and kind of bastardizing the whole thing. Right. So it's really, it'll be really interesting to me to see how this psychedelic wave plays out. You know, there's still a lot of stigma around it. Uh, and there's also a lot of people that are curious and then big pharma is already, you know, sinking their claws into it. My God. Oh yeah. The schedule, the scheduling's already yeah. changing with these mm -hmm. clinical trials. And it's interesting. They're like bifurcating a lot of these substances where a lot of them are schedule one, but they're going to patent some. So like the same substance may be schedule one. It may also be schedule three. It's going to be all over the place. It's the legality is pretty crazy, but. I just want to comment yeah. on what you said earlier about the the stigma of it, people feeling like they're better than other people. This is just my own theory, but I kind of see like this bell curve progression of your experience with psychedelics, where you'll be on this upswing where you do kind of start to talk to your ego and your subconscious and things kind of, your environment gets harder, right? Because you can't interact with the same people. And then it's like, oh, if those people just did the work, then everything would be better. The truth is, it's always about us. Mm -hmm. But then I see like the, not that more is better, but some people that do end up doing more end up kind of falling off that curve and coming back down where there is like this humbling. It almost is analogous to Hollywood. It's like, mm -hmm. B-list actor, you think you're hot shit. And then if you're really at the top, you're like, yeah. I'm so gracious. Like, thank you for being in my presence. You know, we, we see this kind of downshift almost. So it's interesting to be on the, yeah. on the upward trajectory of that curve. And I think those are probably the people that, I think that we're calling annoying. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad you, I, I think I was trying to articulate that earlier and then, you know, ADHD took me off course a little bit because, and, and I think that's normal with everything, right? Like you see that with like CrossFit is a great example. You know, I used to coach CrossFit of like, you know, I was getting really into it and I'm like, I'm, I'm a CrossFit guy. Right. And, you know, you identify and it's like, I got my Reebok nanos and, you know, like, because there's that sense of belonging, right? Like I belong to this community and this culture and I want to embody that because it gives me a sense of belonging. And, you know, Lauren, you've probably heard me say this a million times through FMHP, but it's like, at the end of the day, I, I'm just a truth seeker. And it's like science to me is the objective pursuit of truth. 
spiritual practice and introspection. Introspection is the subjective pursuit of truth, right? Now, you could pursue truth through the vehicle of Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism or, you know, tripping on ayahuasca in Costa Rica or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but to your point, Lauren, I think that's a powerful point and a constructive point to make of, you know, it's kind of high school behavior very much. You like find your click and then you really want to embody it and, you know, wear your cheerleader outfit or your letterman or whatever. But there is that bell-shaped curve of, of maturation and evolution. You might kind of peak and you're maybe getting a little bit big-headed or egoic because you're identifying so hard with this thing. But I do, to your point, I think if you stick with it and, you know, you mature through it and everything, you know, it kind of comes down um, on the other side to a more sort of level and equanimous place. And something I meant to say earlier, and then, and then I'll pivot this back to kind of biohacking and holistic foundations and stuff. Um, but what you just said, Lauren, uh, I meant to share this earlier of like, there was a time I was, I was, uh, on a LSD trip and it was a lovely day, lovely trip. I always like to just go walk in nature and just, you know, be with my thoughts, be with nature, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, and I'm too like jittery to sit still, you know, um, doesn't really work for me, but I just started like saying over and over, I'm, I'm like, nothing has anything to do with anybody but self. And it, it's just like what was coming up. And I just kind of kept saying it over and over and kind of pondering it because it's like, you know, we're all sort of, I don't want to say trapped, but we're all locked into our own consciousness. You know, I can't transplant my consciousness into somebody else's. Like I'm in my body and my soul experiencing reality and truth through the lens of my ego, my super ego, my ID, my primordial epigenetic mechanisms and filters and conditionings and traumas and chosen beliefs and behaviors. And so when you kind of start unpacking that of how, and, and I think it could be misinterpreted of like, that sounds really selfish. Nothing has anything to do with anybody else but yourself. And it's like, I don't mean that in a selfish way. What I'm saying is your experience is completely subjective to your filters that reality is passing through. You know, what you see, what you're experiencing is not what is. It's passing through your filters, right? That's kind of what uh, I meant. Totally. About. Oh, yeah. We, we yeah. agree with that. We talk about that all the time. And my analogy for that is sometimes I'll argue, I'm like, that's blue. And someone else is like, that's purple. I'm like, how could that be? <laughs> I think it's this. Yeah. Yeah, we all have our yeah. different filter and lens and who's to argue what's right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. I actually just heard a story yesterday about the the orchid. I don't know if you guys have heard this. Two people were looking at an orchid and one was mm -hmm. smiling and joyful and the other one was crying. And they said, it's, it's the same flower. How is it totally different? And one, it reminded him of his ex-girlfriend that used to love orchids. And the other one, it reminded her of her grandmother who used to grow orchids in the backyard. And it's like, it's just an orchid, but it completely different lenses and perspectives. I love that. Yeah. yeah so similar too. to the, the purple and the blue, right? But mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So to as, as we start moving in the direction of kind of wrapping up, I, I want to kind of tie this all together where... Because I love how we went from, okay, what is biohacking? Because it, it's not just buying gadgets and spending money on stuff, right? Um, and the ancestral component. To me, and, you know, I criticize myself a lot because it's like I'd rather be the one to kind of, you know, find my blind spots and poke at them rather than like somebody in the audience is like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to give, I don't want to give them that opportunity. Right? You're like, I got it first. Yeah. 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 Beat you to it. MTHFR, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but you know, I kind of like, I've been referring to the blue zones a lot lately in, in that docu-series that they did on, on Netflix. Cause like I have a thing for, for Japanese culture, you know, we're, we're all martial artists here. Like you both have black belts. I have a black belt. That's something we've, you know, connected on before. And so since I was a kid, I've just been so enchanted uh, with Japanese Okinawan culture. I really think the Japanese, like they, I, I can't speak for modern Japan, never been there, but like from a ancient civilization perspective, like they knew what they were doing um, on a lot of levels and looking at, you know, Okinawa as one of the blue zones with a high concentration of centurions. Um, 
To me, I do. I, I love this movement that we see in America with regenerative agriculture and kind of more like, you know, you can live off the grid. Like if you're not digging the societal system and the socioeconomic oppression, like there are other ways, you know, to do this, you know, buy a tiny home or go to one of these kind of communes where everybody's, you know, doing their thing. I think it's kind of beautiful. I, I, I love that in America, we have the freedom to explore you know, those possibilities if we're not digging the system in place. And so I do kind of, um, you know, we'll see where I end up. Now, mind you, let me put this out there where my mother and my father couldn't be more different. You know, my, my father and stepmother, you know, they've, they've got money, they live in their very nice house in a very nice part of town here. Uh, my mother and stepfather have nothing like the only possessions that they really uh you know care to keep and, and maintain are their surfboards and they literally just spend like all day every day surfing and it's just where's where are the waves best right now is it florida is it ecuador i think they're in ecuador right now um very like you want to talk about minimalist like when you're taking cold showers and getting eaten by mosquitoes and putting up mosquito nets so you can catch a wave the next day like that's pretty pretty minimalist. So I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, right? I'm like, okay, I see that. I see that. I want the middle path, but I love this idea of to me, and I, maybe I aspire to this, maybe I'm a raging hypocrite, but like, I love the idea of having that sort of like Okinawan, uh, you know, Zen, simple, tiny Zen home with my little Zen garden, grow your food, sit on the floor, you know, be active, do Tai Chi, maybe trip on psychedelics once in a while. Like to me, conceptually, that looks like the way to live. I don't know. Just putting it out there. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm with yeah. you on that. Yeah. I'm like, break down the walls, get rid of the light bulbs. Let me just be on the grass. And Isn't it funny? Kind of like with some of the biohacking. And, and the reason I brought this up is the ancestral component, the primal component. Isn't it kind of ironic that humans as a species have become so disconnected from our primal, natural, primordial roots of living in the natural world. We're so disconnected from that. Like the idea of like, rather than go put my bare feet on the soil out there, I'm going to have a mat that I buy that's somehow connected to a thing that's connected to the ground so I can do grounding while I sit at my computer. Like, isn't that the most ironic? I it's hate it. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's I hate ridiculous. It. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and Lauren and I were actually asked this on a podcast recently. I think it's if we had all, you know, the millions of dollars, billions of dollars, what would your day look like? Like your day yeah. of biohacking. And we both were like, I would be on the beach for sunrise. I'd be in the mountains hiking during the day. Yeah. I'd be with community at night around the fire pit, maybe having a glass of wine even. You know, and it was like, we, I don't even think we realized it in the moment, but neither one of us mentioned any biohacking gadgets and devices. It was just yeah. like no. being human. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be How on Zoom, that's that. for sure. <laughs> I, yeah. Probably an hour before we got on the podcast, my husband, Jeremy, was like, if you love nature so much, why don't you just do the podcast outside? I'm like, oh, that sounds like an idea. I wish I could. <laughs> but this is the reality yeah. that we live in and it affords us so much for us to be in different places all over the country. And that's awesome too. But yet we always, we have to make nature the priority. And it's unfortunate that we have to biohack. I don't want to be biohacking, but that's the modern world that we live in. And now we do have these other alternatives to help bring us back. But I think to come back to your original question of what biohacking is and isn't, I think of biohacking as a disruption in our like unconscious actions that we're making every day. Like we're just like, on the hamster wheel, doing the same thing every day and not questioning it. The biohack is is the disruption so we can reset and try something different and experience something different sometimes. Because a lot of us don't think about it. We're in terrible lighting and we think that being on Zoom is all is normal all day long. And we do need those biohacking reminders that there is another better way. Mm -hmm. I love that. So where are we moving is the question. Yeah. So where are we all going to go and build what's, a what's community? What's that one in Italy? What's the blue zone in Italy? Icaria? Or is that Greece? Icaria. Uh, oh, Sardinia. No. Sardinia is Italy. Icaria is Greece. Both of those look fabulous. I'm in for either one of those. But yeah. Japan looks nice too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I do like purple potatoes. Right? Oh my gosh. I do like the, the purple sweet potatoes a lot. I'll make like a chili and put, you know, the purple sweet potatoes in there. Um, yeah, super, super good. So I'm curious as we start wrapping up, let's have both of you share top three, top five, you can elaborate, expand, you know, it's up to you guys. Um, but your favorite biohacks, especially now that we've had this so, you know, profound, eclectic kind of redefining, you know, what, what biohacking is within this, within this conversation. So whoever wants to go first of some of your just absolute, like these are the, you know, biohacks that I live by and and swear by. Mm, I love my red light. Mm. I don't know, like, am I reading all the literature? Is it real? I don't know, but I feel amazing when I sit in front of it. And that is enough evidence for me. Yeah. Uh, it's also just such a great opportunity any time of day. I would love to go sit in the grass and sunshine, but there's times in the year where the climate doesn't allow for that. And I can sit and it provides like a really nice cushioned environment where I can slow down, stop multitasking, do my meditation, do my breath work, or just sit quietly. Like it really kind of fosters a, a really nice um, space where I can just be with self. Um, yeah. And I've had like real experiences where I have less pain, where I feel like my skin is better. So is it real? Is it science? I don't know. But like my experiences, I freaking love that thing. Yeah. Um, my second favorite would be the AMP coil, which is a PEMF and Tesla coil technology. And I love this because there's a diagnostic built in. So it reads your vocal vibrations or frequencies and can sort of give you some guidelines about what needs some some nourishing, whether it's like nutritional support or a little cleansing or a little detox. And um, PEMF for anyone that doesn't know is like the good vibes that we get from the earth. And again, I would love to go sit on the grass all day, but I do have to be on Zoom and, you know, sometimes it's too hot, sometimes it's too cold. Um, so I like that I can kind of harness the, the frequencies that are right for my body and what I need on a given day. And the diagnostic, I think, just takes it to a whole other level where it's like, oh, this is really personalized to me. I'm not just hitting play and hoping for the best. Um, I've seen some real life um, confirming experiences where it's like, oh, this technology actually is pretty intelligent. Of course, I would love to not have it. but Again, I think our modern day lives like put a lot of burden on our physiology. And so no, why not harness some of these things if we can, if we can afford it and we have the time to, why not? Absolutely. I have a, I have a lot, but um, to prioritize, aura ring. Okay. So I love this thing. I think everyone needs a way to track their health on a daily basis. And actually a study just came out last week. They found that uh, 79% of Americans that have a wearable found that the wearable improved their health in some way, physical activity, sleep, mental health, something. So that just shows by tracking, we're seeing improvements. So find something, whether it's an aura ring or whatever else. I just, I love that because I can see, are my biohacks working for me with heart rate variability, resting heart rate, sleep scores, things like that. So love the aura ring, the brain tap, it's like meditation on steroids for me. I can just put that thing on and sometimes I'll select, you know, beta, delta, theta, whatever brain waves I want to get into and boom, within a couple minutes I'm there. So it's like, I can be like a meditative monk in seconds. Uh, so that's where technology can be really great because we know the benefits of meditation. Great. But I want to be able to like to be able to zone in really fast. So I love the brain tap. Um, for free this could biohacks. Sound like a shortcut to some people, but uh, again, like we're realists. It's like I'm happy to take not? the shortcut. <laughs> I'm happy Absolutely. to take the shortcut. Yeah. Rather than going and training for years how to get into the, you know, delta wave state in a minute. So um free stuff, sunshine. I can't mm-hmm. tell you how much of a difference it made when I moved to Vegas almost six years ago because yeah. living in Maryland, you know, definitely a seasonal affective disorder winters are were were really rough. Not only was the sun rarely out in the winter, I was also in an office all day. So you combine the two and it was just really hard. So being in Vegas, having sun 350 days a year, whatever, game changer for everything in my health. And then forest bathing. Mm -hmm. That's a free one. Mm -hmm. Can't do it very often in Vegas, but when I can get out into the (laughs) woods, Mm -hmm. 
oh my God, it feels so good. It feels so good. Yeah. I, love that. I have a client I just saw yesterday and we were going through her HRV data and she's like, I can't deny it. But every time I'm in nature, my HRV just shoots up. I'm like, mm -hmm. I can't deny that either. There's something real to that. Yeah. Cool. I, I love all the, uh, I love all these, uh, biohacks. I've, I have yet to really become like a wearable guy. I, I have an aversion to like tech and gadgets and gizmos. I just, um, there's a resistance there. Not that I wouldn't get into it or benefit from it, but, um, you know, for me, I always like to look at any, any tool, it doesn't matter what it is, but any tool that can enhance mindfulness and self-awareness, right? Uh, cause I think, I don't think there's any wearable or lab test that can replace innate intuition, you know, but I, I think some of these tests or gadgets or gizmos or data points or CGMs or aura rings or HR, whatever. Um, I think they can really en enhance, you know, mindfulness in general. It makes me think back to like, back in my good old nutrition coaching days, uh, even like food blogging, you know, counting your macros and weighing your food and all of that while, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the ass to do that for very long, but it does build a ton of, you know, nutritional behavior, awareness, self-awareness, mindfulness, because you really need people to become aware of what they actually are eating, you know, in order to kind of start moving the needle there. Um, you know, some I've heard of all of those. But some of them I wasn't really that familiar with of like brain tap. I see them all over, but I've never really understood like what it is. I love the light therapy though. Uh, Renee, to your point, I mean, I crave sunshine fiercely. It's it's palpable, you know. Uh, the first time I was put on antidepressant was really because it was it was going in wrestling season, it's winter time, and I'm just like, I just feel kind of depressed, right? Um, so sunshine is, is really, uh, really huge. And, and the forest bathing, you know, um, my girlfriend and I, you know, we're hoping to someday move to Arizona. That's where she's from. Um, my only like hiking great in Arizona. Right. And, and I love Arizona. I love the desert. The only thing though, is the green, like here in Kansas, it's super green, you know, I think people overlook Kansas and, and Kansas City is is woodland, you know, Western Kansas, that's farmland, it's flat, it's, you know, there's, there's beautiful parts, but the area I live, it's, it's woodland, you know, so it's just so lush and so green. I've got these beautiful uh, nature trails I go walking on, like, you know, every day going after this probably, but anyway, so I appreciate the, um, you know, the gadgets, the profound conversation. You know, this is, this conversation has been a long time coming and I'm sure we'll do, you know, a part two and three and, you know, it's just kind of an ongoing thing. Um, but I really, really appreciate both of your time, taking the time out of the day, sharing your earned wisdom. And, you know, I, I want to give you both the opportunity before we, uh, conclude, because I do think as we we're speaking offline, the biohacking space seems to be proliferated with male voices. And I, I think it's very important to get more women biohacking voices out there. And you two, I mean, I, I don't know of any other women that are doing what you two are in the space. So I just wanted to give you guys the opportunity to maybe share your perspective on women in biohacking and, and what you hope to see with that. Hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're really honored. And we do have like bunch of gal pals in the space kind of fighting for this personalized approach and everyone's perspective is a little bit different but yeah biohacking was largely started by men and um you know even our our dad we called the og biohacker because he had a, a pemf mat in the 80s and low level laser just red light pbm um but so much of this is bio-individual, right? For men too, but especially for women, I think this comes back to the conversation around narrative mindset and for women that have been put into this kind of more masculine framework um, and haven't been taught or allowed permission to cultivate their own truth, which I think then expresses, it expresses itself in a lack of intuition or a lack of trust in intuition. We like to use biohacking again as a way back to self and just like getting that confidence in your own intuition. So it really is revealing these blind spots. Um, 
and women are tricky, right? We're tricky. We're different every every day of the month, and um, even something that sounds so kind of novel, like cycle syncing, which we're seeing more and more in the biohacking space and really health optimization space, even that is just so incredibly nuanced. It comes down to the individual. It comes down to these conversations and like the space and the time to be heard and, and listened to. And um, we're all just human, like trying to have a better human experience. And I think maybe the flaw with biohacking, as many of us know it, is that we are pushing ourselves into this box. We're like, I'm trying to get out of the box. I'm like, I'm trying to get out of the structure and the system so I can figure out me, my purpose, my best self. So I think I do think that's what women are bringing to it, like a little more creativity, a little more intuition, a little more permission to be in truth. Love that. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I would just add to that with, and the reason I had said that before we hit record, just the female voice and why we need to biohack differently because we are different every day of the month. And I think a lot of women get into biohacking and they see people like, Dave Asprey or maybe even Joe Rogan now that are like 30 days of cold plunging, you know, and it's like <laughs> that may work for men, but for women, because we are changing every day, we can't do that. Cold plunging can be great certain times of the month. Fasting can be great. Sauna, high intensity workouts, you know, it can be great different days. So just really learning your cycle and learning how to optimize those things is so important. And don't just Google like cycle syncing chart, right? Lauren, we were just talking about this because it can give you a guide of like what the typical hormonal cycle looks like on a 28 day cycle, but your body might be a little bit different, right? Your hormones might fluctuate a little bit differently. So really start to track your cycle, journal, see what's happening, see when you feel best in the gym, see when you need more carbs, when you need more sleep and, and just leaning into that. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're we're unique, and I'm sorry, but like when I hear men in the biohacking space talking about like biohacking your period, I'm like, please, come on, get out of here, <laughs> get out of here. You don't know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah, I would just add one more thing onto what you said, Renee. Is like being radically honest. I think we mm -hmm. all have the wisdom that we need within ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. can you just be take some courage, but can you be radically honest? That's it. The biohacking is just kind of helping us chip away and get back to what that is really. It's another vehicle. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you both so much for that. Joining me on the podcast today. I'm sure we'll run it back another time and uh, keep keep collaborating, doing all the great work. I really appreciate your work and, and your message and for taking the time today. Thank Likewise, you so much. We are so honored to be here. You're a force and just so grateful to be friends with you and to have you as my mentor. You're incredible. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Holistic Savage podcast. This is a Wellness Out Loud production produced by Drake Peterson and edited and mixed by Mike Fry. As always, if you liked this episode, please rate it and review it on your podcast app. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. See you next time. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.